Good afternoon or evening, everybody. It is part five of Great Escape Week. And after the very moving time we have spent with Louise Williams yesterday talking about her her uncle being one of the 50 who were murdered and, and all what that entailed for the family and finding out about it and her research into, you know, being taken out by the Czech police and the Gestapo and being shot and all, all that, that, you know, emotional baggage. Today, we are talking about one of the three men, well, two of the three men, really, because two of them were Norwegian, two of the men who actually made a home run of the 76 men who escaped from Stalagluf three 77 years ago yesterday, three actually managed to make their way back home, and two of them were Norwegian. So joining me tonight to talk about the Norwegian aspect and in indeed talk about Norwegian volunteers for the RAF is a Norwegian historian, um, Asgir or Oscar Uland, who is a author of numerous books about Norway's role, SOE. You write for magazines and things. So good evening, uh, Oscar. Uh, how are you today? Good evening, Paul. I'm fine. Uh, nice to be with you. Well, as we said, it's three men made a home run. Not one of them a British, American or Canadian. The movie, which we have to touch on, was was British, Canadians, Americans. But those who actually made it back home were 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 going to countries, interestingly, and we'll touch on this later on, that were still occupied by the Germans. So this whole sense of freedom, if you're a Canadian escaping from Stag of Three and you do make it back to Canada, you have arrived home, you are free, you are safe. If you are Dutch or French or Polish or Norwegian or, or Danish, you are just going to a place that is still occupied by the Germans. So we will touch on that today. But before we delve into um, the actual story we're gonna talk about tonight, I'm asking every one of my guests this week, what was your first introduction to The Great Escape? It was the film, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's correct. And and very much so. Uh, I didn't know a thing about uh, Mr. Muller when I got uh, asked to read his book and, and t tell my opinion about it, because uh, the story of Muller and his companion, uh, Per uh, Bergslan, is not uh, very well known in Norway, funnily enough. And I must say I was... Uh, a bit surprised because I've heard about the story, obviously, and read about it vaguely, but uh, it's not very well known in Norway. It's not like in the Anglo-Saxon world that, you know, the film has been played over and over again. In Norway, it's not been talked much about, funnily enough. And that we will touch on later on the show is that because, you know, the, as we've been established in the earlier shows, there is this global love for the story the love for the film the love for the uh the, the the bravery of the men and you know and it's always a subject of new documentaries and there's one being filmed right now jonathan vance who was on earlier and ted barris are both involved in a new documentary that's coming up guy walters who's on tomorrow has been in, done two or three podcasts this week i think about the great escape so it's still it still holds our attention all these years later. But backpedaling a bit, we've got to bring in Jens Muller. So he actually was one of the few escapers who actually wrote his own memoir and wrote it pretty soon after the war. We had in Britain people like Jimmy James were writing their books sort of five, six decades later, and Ken Reese, I think, wrote one, and they were all very interesting. But Jens, it was, it was reasonably soon after the war. And then you were asked to do the introduction as a Norwegian historian to the re-edition. So he, when his book first came out, um, did it receive much kind of acclaim in Norway or around the world, or, the, or did it kind of just disappear? I, I don't think it, it got much claim around the world, but it, it was reviewed in the in the papers at the time in 1946, which is just you know after the war. So he must have written it fairly soon after he got home from Canada. Uh, the reviews were generally positive. Uh, and uh, it says that it's an amazing story and, and he, you know, he could have told more, but it was enough to kind of get an impression of, of the great escape he went through. Uh, after that, the, the book simply vanished. I don't think it was republished ever, even not in, in 63 when the big film came out. Uh, and it's just vanished from, from public uh, knowledge. And, and I managed to find it in a, in a sort of a, the Norwegian library, National Library has a nice thing that they scan all books published before the year 2000. So I managed to find it there and, and could read through it. Uh, and as I said, I never heard about it before. And, and it's funny that it hasn't been reissued ever since, even now, so much later. Mm. And for a first-hand account, I think it's a very good, uh, good read as well. And you can read it 
fairly quickly. So, so. Yeah, and the, the link below to, to buy it, fo folks, is, is there in the YouTube description. description. And interesting as well, of course, in the publishing in 46, let's say he began writing as soon as he got back home, 44, 45, of course, the investigation of the murders was, was still underway then. So he, he's, from his point of view, it's still very much a, a victory. It's, a, you know, I got back home. I managed to get all the way back. And so it, it's the whole point of what we've been trying to do this week is look at this story from different angles because someone whose family member was murdered was going to think about it differently. And then we had the show with the Canadian uh, family members whose fathers dealt with PTSD. That was another interesting way of looking at it. And because it had been very boring for me to do seven shows just explaining how the escape unfolded, that would kind of just be the same story from uh, with no with all with repetition. But by looking at it from this point of view, it is very interesting. But as we said, Jens Muller was an interesting individual um, before the war. We don't have, unfortunately, folks, many photos of this gentleman. I will show at various points parts of the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So we do have. Um, this is a photo, uh, I'll go back to others later on, of the three men who did make the home run. So the two Norwegians and, and uh, Van der Stock, the Dutchman. So, and Jens Muller is the tall chap on the right there. Um, but we don't have, I haven't found any photos of him really before the war, except we do know he joined the Air Force. So fill in what you know about his background, if you wouldn't mind, um, prior, to that, or prior to World War II and then leading up to being uh, captured. Yeah, first of all, he, he wasn't the average Norwegian uh, type. Uh, he was born in Shanghai in, in China in 1917 uh, and, and grew up there, his first, spent his first uh, uh, four years in Shanghai uh, before their family returned home. His father was working in, in Shanghai and he came from a pretty affluent uh, family in Norwegian standards. Uh, did his schools in Norway and you know, like normal normal schools, and then he competed as a motorbike racer in motorbike races before the war. So, hence, perhaps the the, the motorbike uh, thing in the film. But uh, and he was fairly successful at that. But you know, in the 1930s in Norway, which was uh, you know a part of the Great Depression, it wasn't very normal for people to ride motorbikes in their spare time uh, and do such things. So. He came from a pre pretty affluent family. His, his mother was half British, I think. Uh, and then uh, in 1939, he went off to Switzerland to study uh, in the autumn 1939. So he, he must have started studies pretty much when the Germans invaded Poland. So it seems already we had, like with Louise Williams, thought about her uncle John, there was a sense of adventure these are people who have done a bit with their lives they've traveled it it's not saying that was exclusively the kind of people that ended up escaping but you know th there is this sense of people who liked outdoor spaces they were people who traveled there's a there's a people who see how big the world is i was really imp impressed by what louise said about um her uncle writing these letters about the sky being small in Europe and how Europe, Australians find Europe very kind of restricted because it, everything's closer. And someone who's been to China, someone who's been around Switzerland, you've seen mountains of all shapes and sizes, you've seen massive great oceans. It's, th it's those kind of people who possibly, possibly don't thrive very well in captivity. But we're, we're, we're skipping ahead a bit. So motorbikes travel around the world. 39, he's in Switzerland and, and war breaks out. So do we know what prompted him to want to serve, um, you know, with, with the Royal Air Force? Uh, the, the, the thing that prompted him was uh, the invasion of Norway in on the 9th of April, 1940. Uh, he is, as I said, in Switzerland, and he, he probably hears news that Norway is being invaded and he tries to make his way to Britain. So he... He, he dashes over to France, gets to Bordeaux, and from Bordeaux he gets a boat over to the UK and is probably interrogated in some sense or the other, and then he's moved on, and then he joins the Air Force, which, from the Norwegian perspective, was moved fairly early in 1940 when the government came to exile in the UK in the summer of 1940. They started rebuilding a Norwegian Air Force in Canada, uh, in Ontario. Uh, and so he ends up within the Norwegian Air Force. Um, if you want me to, to talk a bit about the Air Force, uh, there, there are some 
there, there are various people. There, there are actual Air Force, Navy, and Army Air Force pilots who escapes from southern Norway with fishing smacks over to Shetland and then uh, joins up. Uh, there are others who goes via the Far East through Russia, uh, through uh, the Middle East, uh, via Egypt to India, from then to South Africa, over to the West Indies to Halifax in Canada and ends up in Liverpool after nearly half a year of getting over. And then they join up with the Air Force or the SOE, which also was the case. Mm. Uh, may the main part of the non-pilot air, uh, air force guys were actually whalers who came back from the antarctic whaling season uh, they were in durban in south africa got a message over the wireless that they had to say to an allied port and most of them sailed to the uk and then the whalers put up a camp in uh, dumbarton in scotland and they became what was the backbone or the mechanic part of the norwegian air force during the war but Everything had to be built from scratch in Canada, and then obviously they came uh, in, in after the Battle of Britain. They were, were returned to the UK and entered uh, as part of the Royal Air Force uh, with their own squadron, the 331. And, 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 it, and it is worth pointing out just briefly that the British, and we'll touch on the Germans later on, did fast track the Norwegians into their system a little bit faster than perhaps they did other nations, I'm thinking about how slowly we took the, to embracing the Polish, as we know from the film, The Battle of Britain, you know, that they're ready to fly, but we don't trust them quite yet. And the German, we'll touch later on, uh, the German reaction to the, the Scandinavians, because Norway, will, I would like you to elaborate on that kind of slightly unique relationship you have with the, the, the Third Reich, different to perhaps some of the other nations, because Americans perhaps watch it, watching this, they think that all the countries that occupy from France, Poland, Belgium, Norway, that they're treated the same. And the reality is there's it's not the same way the Third Reich operates in those countries, is it? So uh, well, we can touch on that later on. But certainly from the Allied point of view, the British pretty early on embrace how useful the Norwegians can be to us and, and in turn how, how important Norway is as a, as a theatre operation. We did our Operation Claymore shows at the beginning of the month. But um, if you want to just talk a little bit about the, the role of what the Norwegian squadrons were doing, sort of 41, 42, 43, we've got time to do that. I think it would just be interesting to fill in a bit of the blanks there. Well, uh, they did various things. They, they were part of the raid on Dieppe, for example, doing air cover on Dieppe. Uh, Müller himself was sent uh, pretty fast northwards to the Orkneys and later on to, to the Shetland Islands uh, on Sunbra Head, where they did patrolling against the German aircraft, flying uh, recon missions, uh, mostly from Norway, from uh, the Stavanger area. Uh, and they had to scramble and sort of try to, to get these planes away, and it didn't do much combat. And he, he tells about the uh, stories also that, you know, Allied British bombers were stopping by in, in Shetland on their way to Norway to do attacks or photo recons over Norway. So so he was kind of in the backwater of the RAF, if you want. You know, it wasn't, you know, Shetland and Orkney, it wasn't much happening. And then obviously later on they, they were pushed south and they went to the canal zone and, and a lot of the guys they did uh, escort fly, escort flying for 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 example for example the bombers and, and stuff like that. Uh, I haven't really researched the Air Force into death, but I met uh, a former Spitfire pilot who later became the, the Norwegian head of the, the Royal Norwegian Air Force. And he told me some stories about how they flew we are the Churchill's own uh, squadron he was a part of for a while. And even Winston came down to, to shake their hands and stuff. Wow. And, and, and then, he, then he said, you know, he, he told me this anecdote that, you know, they would fly this escort with the Americans. Uh, you know, would, would gather, the bombers would gather and they would fly escort. And he said the Germans actually knew how much fuel the, the fighters had because they could see the, the Focke-Wolfs and the Messerschmitt in the horizon when they had to turn back to get home to home base and refuel. So then, then there was pretty much an air war uh, going on for these guy, guys all the time. Uh, uh, but Müller, uh, you know, he fitted in a young adventurous uh, kid uh, his companion Bergsland who also was in Stalag Luft 3 uh, did a, diff a slightly different route he came with a fishing smack in early 1940 in the mid 1940 uh, and they joined up and they, they had their training in Canada and they were pretty much uh, 
yeah, as you said, brought into the RAF pretty soon. Uh, but the main contribution of the Norwegians uh, in exile, if you want, was, of, of course, the merchant fleet. That was the backbone yeah. of the Norwegian uh, uh, contributing during the war when they sailed, you know, the convoys to the, uh, over the Atlantic in the Far East and, and so forth. And then when we get to the point, of course, where he he is captured, and if you want to explain a bit about that, we can. And and then we'll go, of course, as well to the the other important aspect about being a Norwegian or a Dane in a prisoner of war camp is you are from one of the potential escape avenues. I mean, if you're in a prisoner of war camp in Germany, you kind of go Spain, Switzerland, or neutral Sweden. And so anybody who is Danish, Norwegian, or or from the even the north coast of Germany, you've got that knowledge of ports, you've got the, the place Stetten and Danzig and all those things there. So and also the language ability, because you've to, to if you're gonna make a home run and you're British or Canadian, you've got to pick up some kind of local language at least to kind of make yourself understood somewhere. So but but let's we're, we're skipping ahead ourselves. It's me me being excited, but um how how did he end up becoming a prisoner of war well he he went on a raid uh, there were two squadrons he, he writes three but uh, when i looked it up and did the footnotes i found out there was only two squadrons doing a raid on uh, on uh, merchant ships outside of holland uh they do the raiding and uh, he fires his guns and he, he sees that the traces are coming out you know the last bullets are flying out and he's unarmed he tries to dash home uh, to England, and then uh, he got shot down and ends up in a dinghy uh, for about 66 hours. He tries, obviously, to get back to Britain, but uh, the currents and, and the weather brings him ashore in, in Belgium, and, and he tries to sneak ashore. He managed to sneak ashore, and then he basically walks into to a German patrol and is captured, and uh, the war is over for, for Jens Müller uh, so far. And and did do you know if he immediately kind of earned a reputation for trying to escape, or did he kind of bide his time for a bit? Because that's the myth is that everybody in Stagler Three was a bad boy. Yes, there were lots of the guys there, but by by the time of the Great Escape in March forty four, it's just filling up with aviators because so many are coming down. Uh, and of the thousands that were there, we now know sort of six hundred actively involved in escaping, but. Did 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 Jens kind of show aptitude for escaping early on? It, it doesn't seem like it from his account. You know, he, he has these briefs that he's gotten before before he flies out. That you know, m ways of escaping, the ways the the Germans try to trap you and and get information and and all these kind of things. And he's he's very he's swiftly moved from Belgium via France down to a, to a lager in, in near Frankfurt am Main. You know, in the, in 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 the west. What, what was West Germany after the yeah. war, and uh, and you know there he spends time, gets to know, feels uh, feels his way around a bit. But we have to take into consideration that he was actually the first Norwegian who was captured, uh, by, uh, first Air Force pilot who was captured. So it, so you know, contrary to the British and and Canadians and and, and Australians, he. he he didn't have very much to go on in terms of how to escape or, 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 or dashing away. And he seems to have been pre pretty well behaved uh, in the beginning. And, and he's definitely not the type who, who tries to get away within the first uh, second he got to the camp in Frankfurt. And then obviously he stays there for a couple of weeks where, where before he's moved eastwards to uh, what became uh, Luftstalag uh, 3. Mm. And do just with regards Norwegians being taken prisoner by the Germans, you know, we said we were going to talk about this. How were they treated by the Germans? I mean, I know that's a sweeping statement and there's lots of variety within that. But if you could explain a little bit to our viewers about Norway's ranking, if you like, within the Third Reich, because it's, I say, it's not the same as Poland, it's not the same as France. Uh, no, for sure. Uh, there are various aspects on these uh, accounts. Uh, pilots, I think, were treated fairly fairly well. Uh, commandos, SOE operatives captured were normally shot. There are a few exemptions uh, where people weren't shot. Uh, according to the so-called commando befell, where Hitler said that any saboteurs yeah. should be shot. Uh, so, so there were Norwegians who were shot. Uh, uh, for being saboteurs uh, fairly early on in, in the war. Uh, I think the first cases are in already in the this early spring of 1941. Uh, 
you had this obviously you had this German image of the Übermensch, you know, the Nordic blonde races, uh, which was supposed to to mean a lot uh, to the German race, and and uh, you know, Anglo. Uh, you had the, the, the so-called German tribes around the world. So the German dream about Norway, which is an issue I haven't uh, studied into depth, but it's, it's there. Uh, uh, you know, Hitler this recently came out this brilliant book about how Hitler wanted to make Norway into this architectural path of the Thousand Year Reich. And Trondheim was supposed to be this amazing city with a great doom, do, dome and... and and, and uh, you know the Norwegians were used uh, in this Lebensborn program, you know, to make blonde Aryan kids. Uh, but by and large, I think uh, the Germans were a bit disappointed after a while with the Norwegians. Uh, you know, obviously there were Norwegians joining the the Waffen SS. About five thousand of them. Uh, there was about five thousand who who made it over to the UK as soldiers or. or or, or SOE agents, and then of course the merchant navy, which which, which was mm. about twenty thousand. So so the image of Norway in Germany was a very strong one. You have everything from the you know the Wagner operas to to you know the the blonde tall. But you know when you if you traveled across the Norwegian coast in 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 uh, in nineteen forty say, uh, you would see that the coast is not doesn't consist of sort of tall blonde men. Um, by and large, you know, uh, I think the number of blondes were, were, were high in Sweden, actually, and the, and the inland areas, because along the coast, you had all these sailors uh, drift to the shore, you know, from the 15th century or or upwards, you know, so so the, you you find a lot of dark people in Norway, so you have mm. dark haired people, etc. So there was this image of the Nor Nordic race being, you know, this perfect, slim, trimmed, but, you know, that's much as much to do, I think, with nature and, uh, and yeah. the harsh condition. Then, so so there was this German image and dream about Norwegians. But you know, if you were a resistance fighter, then you you were treated accordingly. Mm. But do we think, for example, there was been any, would any been any um, inclination of the Germans to try and convert Muller to, to their side? Because there would have been some Norwegians serving within the Third Reich, or did they? Do you think they just immediately recognize him? He's an allied pilot, therefore he's enemy. He goes in with the others, or would they, you know, because we know with Russians and Hungary, you know, there are there are the Austin trooper in Normandy and things like that. You know, I'm just I'm intrigued as whether there's any difference to, to him because he's Norwegian compared to, for example, a Pole, you know, and, and frankly, Polish air aviators were lucky to end up in a proper prisoner of war camp for pilots because they some of them weren't, some of them ended up being put in in, in far worse places. So you know, we have this movie idea from the movie of this equality in the prisoner of war camp system. And the reality is there isn't an equality. There is a there is a pecking order. There are levels of there are levels of um um the Germans perceive captured um airmen. And you know, just so do you think do you think there'd be any attempt to turn him? No, no, I, I wouldn't think so because I think the 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 the, RA, uh, the, the Norwegian RAF guys were were so committed to the course, and yeah. and you know they they were the sign of the knights of of the Second World War, if you want, you know, uh, really at the top of the game, and uh, and also I know, but I know from from other camps, you know, like the Sachsenhausen camp or or the Nacht und Nebel camps in France, uh, that Norwegians were treated better than the Slavs. Eh? Yeah. Uh, they got they got more parcels from the Red Cross and 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 they also had shared shared with other inmates but but you know they were treated better by and large and and you know the guy who became prime minister of Norway after the war and I think I mean four of the first ministers in the cabinet after the war they they were had been in Sachsenhausen during the war for for about mm. three years and and by and large they were treated better than the other inmates but that doesn't say that you know they were treated very well and I think you know compared to uh, what the airmen got in, in Stalag Three, I think they were treated horribly, much much more horribly than than yeah. the, the airmen. So, but I think, without having dwelt into it a lot, I think by and large the the, the, the respect between the pilots were it was something else. I think yeah. it's a bit like tank commanders, perhaps as well uh, during yeah. the war. You know. It wasn't these ragged saboteurs who went behind enemy lines and blew up bridges and you know did the uh, sort of unrestricted warfare. It was it, it was it was kind of okay. You're down. You're captured. Uh, that's it, kind of. And and obviously they didn't think that that people would break out from the hinterland of the German mm -hmm. Reich at the time. Mm -hmm. So he's in Stagler Three eventually. 
the ex organization is is there. It's building up this idea. We've talked about the earlier shows, Bushel of getting 250 men out, uh, disrupting the German um, system, getting all the people out, the police, and everybody try, going to just causing chaos. How does well, we know he escaped, but how does he end up? in X organization as we said earlier the fact he's norwegian he's got language he's got information he's a flyer he's got that but was he actively involved in the preparation of the tunnel because he must have been high enough in the organization to get a place because he got a high place and he was in one of the 76 to go down so what do we know about his role in the in the actual preparation of the escape yeah i know i know his role according to myself it was that you know he was a bit of a handyman he made these wooden spoons and could carve out wooden spoons and stuff and and people and organizations saw him uh, and they saw, yeah, this man can be useful. And then they asked him to do, to help out, to, to provide the, the oxygen system, the pumps that has, has gone foul. Uh, and, and, he, and he managed to fix the pumps in the, the old lager before they were moved to the new one. Uh, and he, they obviously saw him as, as a man who could be able to help them out with a technical perspective. So his role, if you want, is, is to, to provide the, 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 the pumps who, who help uh, getting oxygen into the tunnels, and hence he gets a part of it. Uh, what his companions, the other Norwegians who were uh, with the gang, I, I'm not sure what they did uh, that made them uh, available, but I know that Per Bergsland, the other Norwegian who escaped, he had studied in Germany for several years before the war, and his German was pretty much like uh, a native. So. I don't know if it was language skills or, or whatever, but uh, uh, for Per, it was uh, for for Jens. Sorry, it was definitely the, the one that he could help out on the technical side. Yeah, I mean the thing about Paul Brickhill's original book is that he seems to single out the people who who were really good at one job. So that this man was a forger, this man was a a carpenter. But clearly, some of them were just good all-rounders. They were they were kind of a bit of everything. And so, in Muller's case, a bit of a handyman, language, just a good person to have as part of the team. Just um, not one thing being especially important, but several things all being equally important. And clearly, Bushel knows how to recognize talent in people. He had a huge field to to draw from. And the people he chose were obviously ones he entrusted implicitly. And, and also, I think something about this spirit, this you want people who think the same kind of way and will buy into this idea. Um, and we talked about it with Louise about the, it for, for Bushnell, it's about getting men out of the camp. It's not necessarily about getting men home. It's about a war effort. Um, and that's the kind of the paradox is that the actual getting home bit, which became very important to some people. And in, in fact, even in the movie, James Garner says that to Richard Atterbury says, you know, some of us uh, have actually dreaming and going back home. And he's in, in, in Bartlett playing Bushel goes, you know, do you think I haven't thought about that myself? Do you, do you think I haven't thought about going back home? But he is driven by this bigger, this bigger idea of snarling up the German war machine, which may or may not have worked to the, how he planned it. But, we get the night of the escape and we don't need to recount what happened again. Um, the, the, the tunnel comes up short. There's the air raid that night. And of the intended 250 men to escape from Hut 104, um, 76 break out. And over the net, then it just, everything goes crazy. Every policeman, every farmer who can hold a shovel, every authority figure just leaps out. And, and 73 of the men are very, very quickly within two weeks. Um, captured but what is muller's story how, how does he how did he how does he get out how does he avoid this um and and take us through what happened next yeah that's uh, obviously we're back to the norwegian angle here with the, yeah. with the german view on the norwegians and and uh, uh him and, and Bergsland, they they decide to go together and head for the team which was the aim for for them uh the other two norwegians who escaped they, they had the other direction i think one had tried to get to denmark and from there but uh, he was captured as well, and uh, uh, the forgery section put up uh, uh, passes saying they were Norwegian uh, laborers who went to Germany to to work, uh, make some money, which wasn't uncommon uh, during the war. Uh, you know, it wasn't that that thousands were going to Germany to work, but it wasn't uncommon that uh, Norwegians went to Germany for for a job. And, and so they, they passed out to these laborers who, who walked the route. So they, they basically walked to the nearest train station and, and headed off uh, with the local train uh, 
to a train junction uh, uh, not too far away, and then they hang around <laughs> the train station waiting to be, be caught, obviously, we know as, as can be, and then they, they get this uh, ticket to Statine, and uh, and there they have an address, actually in a brothel. Brothel, they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a brothel where they, where they should sort of knock on a door. Uh, they get on the second ride, a train ride uh, to Statine, which is obviously a port c- city on the on the Baltic Sea. Uh, they end up there, and you that that certain they, they're going to be caught uh, when when they get the tics, tickets inspected. But they basically walk into the city early in the morning uh, on court, and then they go go to this uh, building eventually, knocks on the door. They end up in a brothel, but but the wrong brothel. So they, they haven't got <laughs> they haven't got their, their contacts in order, and then they eventually end up in this uh, neighboring brothel. Uh, they, they were told to go to, to number seventeen in the street, and then they go to number sixteen, which was the actual brothel they, they should go to, uh, where where there were mostly uh, Czech and, and French girls, as they write uh, as he writes in his memoir, and uh, a lot of Swedish sailor having good time in Statin before they. Uh, Supposed to go back to neutral Sweden after after having a hard day uh, day's labor on board the ship. Uh, so Müller managed to to sneak on board uh, and his companion. They managed to sneak on board the ship, get get in touch with the Swedish sailor, sort of lures them on, on board the ship. And and uh, while they're at the ship, uh, obviously he's getting searched, which is you know, if you if you want a cliffhanger, you know that's the perfect cliffhanger. And then. Yeah. They're not discovered, and the seal, the ship eventually sails off for Gothenburg, uh, which is which was a major Swedish port city then, and and still is. And from there, they they uh, go ashore and contact uh, the British consulate, and uh, when they, when he finds out what's going on, uh, he's, they've been sent by by train to Stockholm, and there they're being handled by the British uh, embassy uh, in Stockholm, and. The story gets uh, wired back to the UK, obviously, for confirmation. And then after 10 days in Mary Stockholm, neutral Stockholm, they, they are on a flight uh, back to, to Scotland. And the ridiculous thing about the story is, is actually the escape goes, I don't want to say easily, but it really, it, it's it's not as an exciting story as you think it's kind of going to be. Because for narrative purposes, you say you want these kind of, moments of peril where they're nearly captured but and when we compare it to some of the other escape well even you know, even louise talking about her uncle yeah that and it's, it's the language it's the language thing and it's the fact there are lots of foreigners moving about the third reich at this point and if you're a canadian even if you're pretending to be french or british or australian you do stand out that much more and because we we, we western we english speakers are not good at learning foreign languages we always stand out we go into our places and ask for our sausages and our cups of tea and we give ourselves away so easy, but yeah, the escape itself went really quite easily. Um, what what happened when he you know he he's, we, he gets back and what happened next? I mean, what, did they make a fuss about it? Was he was he was he offered roles in um, you know MI six or MI seven because that happened to people who got to have a cold? It's what what was what what was his next story? No, firstly, I need to say that there also what's interesting when he describes the train journey is that, you know, there's a lot of foreign workers on board the train from from the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia as it was then and Poland. So, you know, we could say that uh, that uh, Bergsland and Müller, they they are not uh, sort of the odd ones out on that train. So, so, So that helps them a lot, I think. Uh, when he eventually gets back to Lucas in, in Scotland, they, he's obviously being sent to London for de- debrief. They have to write their reports. And then he's uh, basically back with the Norwegian Air Force and he's shipped over to Canada again and, and becomes a training officer in the base in Canada. So the last year of the war, Müller spent in Canada training uh, young recruits. Uh, and as, as I said also, when he, when he returns home to Norway, he writes this book, or maybe he did it already in Canada, he wrote a manuscript over there. But the book book gets published, and then he become a, a civil aviation uh, pilot. And, and that's his entire career after war, which is also the case of, of his companion. Yeah, uh, Per ba- Bergsland became uh, head of a Norwegian air company, which... It's mainly sort of inside Norway, flying this uh, short uh, range uh, airfields around Norway, you know, between the villages or between the sort of 
abandoned places and all. Because one of those interesting things that gets said, but you can't kind of find it written down, is that if you had escaped from a prisoner of war camp once, you were discouraged, prevented, there's lots of words you could use there, from going back in that kind of environment again. Although we know it did happen. SOE agents like Violet Zabo went in once under one cover name, went back, and then went in a second time and ended up getting captured. But you do read, but you say you don't find a source for it, that his, his photo is going to be on file. That's the thing, isn't it? You know, that having been a prisoner of the Germans, there's a photo there. And if you do something again, are you are you more likely to be, if you were captured a second time, to be shot? Are you going to be treated worse? So that it could be that he was sort of forced into this training instructor role, or it could be that just just ended up where he ended up because that's how the RAF works. And you know, it's just an interesting aspect that of that of that of the fact he had been an escaper. Uh, yeah, that's and, there. And I think a further interesting aspect is is that he writes in his book towards the very end is that you know he didn't know the faith of the other ones until he was on board the ship going to Canada. So, you know, he didn't know there were only three of them who got, got out, or two of them at least. You know, he, I, I'm, I'm doubt he knew that the Dutchman got out as well. But, but uh, you know, he knew, definitely knew about the faith of the other ones. And, and you know, he, he spent a year and a half about in a prisoner of war camp. So maybe he wasn't that keen on flying again, or maybe things had changed within the, the regiment. We, we don't know. But but by the time he got back to the UK, you know, uh, Overlord was was up and running, or mm. and 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 you know there were other considerations. And the thing is that the Norwegians also didn't want to participate in that much on the continent. There are a few exceptions, which are the Ten Commando, uh, the Inter Allied mm. Commando, who took part in, in Valkyrie in, in in Holland. Uh, and about 12, I think, Norwegian tank commanders who, who was aboard the, with the British at Sword or Gold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and obviously the Air Force and, and the Merchant Marine, but uh, as such, and, and also a few other Navy vessels. But I, as such, you know, the focus of the Norwegian by then was, you know, to get back to Norway and, and, and free the country because. We have to remember that since the, you talk about Claymore early on, but since the second low foot and raids, yeah. uh, from the summer 1941, there were, uh, uh, sorry, 42, there were about uh, 300,000 German troops in Norway with a population of 3 million. So that makes it 1 to 10 in terms of, of, yeah. of yeah. soldier to civilians. Uh, and it was very, you know, by the time that allies were moving on on the continent, it was very unclear what was going to happen in Norway, if the Germans were going to make a last stand in the hills of Norway or whatever. And on top of the 300,000, there was also uh, there was also the the, the, the the armies breaking out from the northern Norway and the northern Finland and, and Russia. So, so, you know, there were pretty many Germans in Norway in, in the era of 44. So, so... Mm. True. I mean, the, the Norwegian policies then was, you know, we need to get back to a country and have as many men as possible. And hence, also the parachute company wasn't sent to to Market Garden. Uh, the Norwegians were set up to jump into Market Garden, but the government vetoed it, so so they didn't go in in the end. Yeah, we've just had a question come in about how they got from Sweden to Britain, and it's from the Great Dominion saying, did they return via one of the clandestine BOAC mosquito flights that regularly landed in Sweden? Was that their route back? <laughs> Yeah, there were, there were actually two kind of routes. There were, were the, 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 the hop route, which, which, you know, they used for SOE agents and so more, more with which they flew this uh, transport airplanes with, with several seats. That, but both the pilots you know, were, were flown back by mosquitoes. So, uh, you know, with, with two seats, so there was a pilot and, and the passenger. And then mm. they landed within a few hours from each other in, 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 uh, in Lucas. Yeah, so... I mean, it's it's a fascinating story, but we've got more to talk about. And what we want to talk about now is this: is when we did our pre-chat earlier on today, folks, is this idea that, that the great escape being perceived differently in different places and by different groups of people. And and you know, you're saying that Norway Norway doesn't have this big connection with the great escape. He wasn't. I mean, I can only imagine how if there had been a British survive of the great escape given the zeal we went in britain about hunting down the murderers which guy waldles would explain tomorrow if there'd been a british guy um jimmy james for example if he had managed to get back to britain and he'd arrived there in june 1944 
I can only imagine he would have been an absolute superstar at that point. He'd have been going on the kind of um, uh, drives to get people to, to to invest in, you know, whatever it was to the war effort. He'd be out there. He'd be, they'd, they'd probably make a movie about it. All sorts of things would have happened. And I know obviously he doesn't, the end doesn't get to Norway till later on, but I'm, I'm sort of surprised more wasn't made of his story. And certainly post-war, certainly post-war, why there wasn't much more of a fact. The three of these guys got back home. Um, but if it seems the British and Canadian Australian interest is in the 50 who were murdered. Understandably, I'm not belittling that. But the, it does seem that the fact three men got back home seems to be the forgotten part of the story. And that, that I find that intriguing. What's your take on that as to why these Norwegians didn't become kind of world famous because of this? <laughs> Well, I think, firstly, I think he published his book too early because, yeah. I mean, the Norwegians were busy, you know, getting their lives back together after the war in 1946. You know, people didn't have much spare time to read books or pick up on the story and, 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 and whatever. If he had written it, say, 20 years later or 25 years later, it might have become a well-known story in Norway. But it, it basically drowned in other things. And... and uh, a few years before uh, the Great Escape, the movie came uh, in 1963. There was a Norwegian movie. Was or a few years after, uh, there was a Norwegian movie made by uh, about another Great Escape in Norway, which is called Nine Lives, which is based on the book We Die Alone, about this Norwegian who, who managed to get out uh, from northern Norway over the hills, uh, stays in the snow, had to amputate uh, all his feet, uh, toes, and stuff like that, and. That became sort of the great escape story in Norway itself. Uh, but but I agree with you. You know, when I started reading this book, I thought, oh my God, what, what's what's going on here? This is an international story. Everybody knows about it. Sixty six percent or two thirds are Norwegian who, who get out. Exactly. And yet yet nobody's heard of them. And I actually before. A couple of days ago, I called a few friends who are dealing with World War II history, uh, you know, who knows a lot of stuff, and asked them, well, what do you connect with the, with the name James Muller? And they said, uh, sorry, James, uh, Jens Muller. And, I, and they said, nothing. You know, I, I never heard of the guy. And, and, uh, and they, these are people who read, you know, most of the literature that is out about the, the Second World War. And after we talked earlier today, I, I come to think of this, that perhaps it's the... <laughs> There is this sense, uh, I'm not sure if I'm correct there, but seeing from, from, from the other side of the North Sea, you know, there's this sense that the British really love this heroic defeat story. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, from the charge of the Light Brigade via Gordon in Khartoum, uh, up to, you know, First World War stories, etc. you know. Arnhem. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Arnhem. Yeah. And, and in Norway, we don't have that sort of same culture for that, because obviously we have to remember as well that prior to being invaded by Germany in 1940, Norway hadn't been at war since the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and that, you know, it, we, don't, we didn't have any sort of deep history regarding wars and how it was. And, uh, you know, there were a few volunteers on the Danish-Prussia Wars in, in 1864, and maybe a few volunteers who went to the First World War, but it wasn't a part of our grander history and, and 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 because of that i think there's a different in the kind of concept of, of what what sells or what is popular but i think this is a story that you know it's beyond belief even if you if you're not very much interested but I, also because it happened abroad you know it wasn't back in norway uh, the guy flew for the brits he, he didn't fly over norway uh, like the mosquito squadrons, for example, or the, or the yeah. Catalinas who, who set, put in agents and stuff like that. But th there might be something to that as well. And I think uh, my perspective is, you know, we need to try to see things from various angles. Uh, you know, uh, I try in my books to put sort of the British perspective much more in the foreline that, than it's usually in Norway because we look at it much more like sort of national Norwegian history than we look at it in the broader sense. So uh, I really I, I really like this idea of, you know, trying to see things in the broader perspective. But, you know, it beats me that this story isn't bigger in Norway because even a documentary should have been made about it, uh, you know. And when you search the archives for stuff about it, you don't find anything. Even, you know, 
things like the 25 year after the war, they, they did sort of about sort of 20 radio programs about various events where Norwegians were involved and there's no trace of Müller then. Yeah, I mean, and I've done my prep for the show and I've been tracking down all the old British documentaries about the Great Escape and and the reality is as well, of the, of the three men who got back home, two wrote their books. So it's not like we're lacking in information either. It's not like they, I mean, they could have all died in 1946, but no, two of the three wrote their stories. Yeah. And yet our British focus still is on bushel, the escape, the, the planning, the, 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 the kit bag to make the pumps, the penguins, and then the investigations. And I'm, of course, I'm, viewers, I'm not belittling the importance of bringing these guys to justice. I'm not belittling the hunt for the Gestapo. But why haven't we in Britain done a documentary about the three men who made it back home? Why haven't we done a TV movie about it? We've kind of shown their stories because Charles Bronson and John Layton are the two Norwegians in the movie. And James Coburn, playing Australian is the Dutch guy because that's pretty much how they escaped. The Dutch guy went over the border in the Pyrenees into Spain and the two Norwegian guys via a boat to Sweden, which is, I know Bronson and Leighton row down a river, but it, that you do see them climbing up the steps onto a ship. I don't know if they're clear which harbour it is. I don't know they specify which. No, I don't think so, no. But it doesn't matter. It's their story, isn't it? So, we all, everybody who's seen the film knows a little bit about these three guys who got back home, and yet we've never expanded upon it. And that, again, I find that extraordinary. No, but I also, I also think it's very natural that people are more, you know, we. Why do we read the local newspaper? Because we know to want, want to know what our neighbours are up to. You know, that's why we read it. Yeah. And and the, and the closer the home, the better. You know, it's 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 a bit like that. And I and I think, but but. Then again, you know, it's, it's a contradiction of terms because the Norwegians really should flag this story because it's two of their guys, you know, in the Air Force, and which took part of the most famous escape, I think, during, during the entire war. You know, there might have been other escapes that I, you know, can't, can't remember at the time or, or which, you know, we haven't heard about. I know the, the, the river cry thing or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. uh, uh, I, ha I have no, you know, real good explanation why it's just disappeared on the in the Norwegian sort of public uh, public view or, or public uh, history or memory. Uh, but there are there are a few of these stories that you know, as 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 we know that you know there are a few stories that everybody's talking about. And then, but but it's interesting that you know this is a very important thing in the UK. Uh, Australia, perhaps, and, and the film is shown again and again and again. In Norway, I think I've seen the film once, and that was like, I don't know, 25 years ago or something on a Monday evening. Wow. And see, the, see and to a Brit, that just seems crazy because, you know, we've got our film show tomorrow night, and, you know, the, Robbie, who's joining me on the show, has been doing his researches into me mentions of the great escape in pop culture. I mean, it's like, it's like when you buy the, the last Star Wars box set when they came out on Blu-ray, there was an entire disc of just all the spoofs, all the time Star Wars has been spoofed on Robot Chicken and The Simpsons. This, and you could do the same thing with Great Escape. You could literally fill up a DVD of extras of just the amount of times it has been spoofed in in TV commercials and and. And yeah, and that's and and the, the odd paradox of that is we spoof about it. Every, as I said to you earlier. Any, any British guy of our, my age saying to a fellow British guy, good luck, you know what the joke is. You know exactly what that means and you laugh. Or if you do the penguin walk where you pretend you've got sand down your chest. Everyone, you know, British people of a certain age, if you're in Butlins, a holiday camp, you make a joke about tunneling out. You make a joke about needing your house vice. It is just part of our thing. And yet we do that with a story that ended up with the biggest murder of Allied prisoners in World War II. So it's weird. It is odd how we manage to kind of look at some aspects of it and ignore other aspects of it at, at, at the same time. It's a, we did this war hunt. We fought, we found these people, we brought the justice and yet we could also make jokes about the escape. It's it. That's why I was really intrigued by this week of how many different ways we could look at this story and unravel this, this this thing that is the great escape um yeah. because it is amazing um no but i, I think I think that's that's the power of hollywood for you you know that, that we you know we we all sit down and watch these videos or, or tv films or, or go to the cinema or used to go to the cinema at least you know and and 
and that becomes the sort of perception of what happened is the Hollywood version. And and there are few and far between who actually read the books about uh, you know events. Uh, it's like you know what Saving Private Ryan did for for Normandy. It's it's uh, yeah, you know absolutely. it's obvious. Uh, and and uh, but but then again you know. Uh, it took some years before realism got into the Western war movies. Again, if you if you watch the Soviet ones, they're much more realistic already in the fifties. You know, so it's uh, it's an interesting factor factor that uh, the the films have this power. But I think also that has to do it because there are no Norwegians in the Great Escape, the movie. You no, know, there, mm, there, there isn't anyone. I mean, so this, there's, there's nothing to put it on, kind of. So well, when did the re-edition of the book with your introduction come out? If you might, uh, it, it was the first, actually, the first English edition of the book. So, and when so was that? The, when, did it, when was that? That was uh, that was in 2018, I think it was. Uh, so we're talking so three years ago now. So yeah. How many times, may I ask, since that came out, have you been approached by British TV makers, historians, documentary makers to con talk about Muller? Uh, actually, I, I'll, I'll be quite honest with you. Am you're I the, the first? first. You're, you're the first one. I was I, kind I, of hoping you were going to say I, that. I, 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 I kind of forgotten about the book as well before you contacted me, so I, I was in a big panic. I had to reread what I, what but I isn't, wrote. But it, isn't that <laughs> fascinating? It, it, when you look at it like that, I mean, I don't know how many documentaries have come out about The Great Escape in the last three years and how many things on YouTube there are. But, I've, I, you know, in my prep, I just search great. There's all sorts. There's animated versions. There's little things there. And yet it, you've had a book out where you are the contributing historian to it about a guy who made a home run, and I'm the first person to ask you to come and talk about it. I just think that – I don't know what that says about people, but it says something about how we're looking at history. Yeah, well, either that or people like like tragedies more than more than they like successes or comedies. And uh, but I, I think true. as well, I think as well because you know the book wasn't very available for for over half a century. You know, uh, it wasn't available in any language apart from Norwegian. And you know, we can say what we want, but I don't don't think the ma majority of people. Are, on this globe, uh, know any Norwegians? They know the odd words, perhaps, but but uh, not uh, language. It isn't a big language, and, and you know, it, as I said, the book wasn't available uh, anywhere before it was re reissued now in, in in an English version. And I think uh, perhaps uh, in time it might be uh, more interesting to look into the the escapees than the, the ones who got caught. But I mean. Uh, it it's really fascinates me why why the story isn't known in Norway. Well, that, and that, I, I, that, I'm sure if I wrote an article about tomorrow, people, you know, ninety percent or ninety five percent would be surprised. Oh, the, the Norwegian participates. In it. And that that is the interesting thing is if we knew why certain things were popular and why certain things weren't popular, you know, Hollywood wouldn't make films that that that, that flop. That if if they knew what the perfect solution was, there would be no disasters at the box office there would be no books that don't find their market and the reality is they just that certain subjects seem to get people going and other subjects don't and the angle that people have looked at the great escape has seemingly not focused on those who got back home and it, and, it, and i don't think we'll we'll understand why that is tonight but at least we've kind of kicked the idea around and and discussed it a bit so we'll, we'll bring things to an end Freddie. so but you know to you so 77 years ago this week you're kind of saying that you're unlikely to see anything in a Norwegian newspaper about the fact this anniversary was then, whereas, you know, there are things. I mean, Guy Walters has done several TV spots this week, Jonathan Vance is doing, because it is something, even though it's not a big anniversary. So, I mean, I guess by the time the 80th comes around, it'll pick up a bit of a bit more popularity. But every year, these people who write about The Great Escape, Ted Barris, they get booked to do stuff. I mean, Ted Barris has given his Great Escape lecture in Canada and the USA, I think, over two hundred times now. So there's there, there's a big demand for that. Oh, the Great Escape! It it puts bums on seats, we say in Britain. But yeah, anyway. but perhaps I'm a bit like Müller, you know. I got away with it and and then stayed quiet for the rest of my life. That is true, and that, and yeah, and, and yeah, the, the the Müller story. I mean, the fact he didn't seem to dine out on it for years. He did. I mean, he didn't live. A long, long, but Bergstrom lived longer than than Muller did, and I think. But it, I just I can't believe in all those years they weren't picked up for documentaries. They weren't made a fuss of when the film came out, and it's just it's just interesting. Um, yeah, I agree. but anyway, it's been really cool talking to you, and I'd like to come you bring bring you back on again, and we do some more stuff about Norwegian history because 
it's an aspect of what we talked with Alexander Clark on the Claymore show, that there's lots of things that could have happened in 1940 slightly differently that would have influenced things um, greatly. Um, there's the, 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 all the merchant mariners. There's that aspect there that we bring to it. There's Norwegian, Danish landing craft crews on Norway uh, on D-Day we could talk about. Um, and indeed, we can go into more depth about the, uh, the Norwegian Air Force squadrons. That would be interesting as well. But um, um, I hope you go and watch the film again and, you you know, it turns up on Norwegian TV. I hope maybe this is the first of many invites that come your way to expand on it and you'll feel the need to do a, a book about all three of the escape. I don't know, but I hope it kickstarts some interest. And it is it is very interesting that that we have focused on the tragedy of this story more than the fact there is this this success story and, and as in terms of escapes three out of 76 getting back home is you know is not insignificant i mean the, how many people got out of cold it's things like that were recaptured there were very few home runs really so mm. um and especially given we know how many germans were after these guys that three people okay they we've been through that they had the language of they were foreign they blended in a bit better but Anyway, it's been brilliant talking to you. I will um, bring the things to an end shortly. So thanks for everybody watching. Don't forget, we've got two shows tomorrow to conclude Great Escape Week. So Guy Walters is coming on in the early, late afternoon to talk about this tragic aspect. We are going to focus on the aftermath, the German orders that ended up seeing 50 men being shot. We're going to talk about how the Germans did that, how they accomplished it, the paper trail that eventually led to their downfall. We'll talk about the RAF and uh, investigations into these murders after war and again kind of bring things to with Guy's conclusions about where he thinks the great escape sits in the legacy. And then we've got a bit later on in the evening, we've got our kind of a free for all talk about the movie. We're just going to talk about the impact of the movie and some of these pop culture references. But it remains for me to say thank you to, to, to our guest from Norway and uh, to everybody else watching. Um, I will see you tomorrow. And um, will you come back and do something again, sir? Thank you for having me, Paul. I, I would love to, and I uh, hope to see you in Normandy sometimes in the future when we get I'm back to some normality. I'll, I'll buy you a beer. Uh, you, you're welcome whenever you want. So thanks for watching, everybody. So this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV. Don't forget, check out the links below. Consider becoming a patron. Follow myself and or Oscar on Twitter. You can find the, uh, his Twitter details in the description below. Consider getting this book about Jens Muller. It gives us that other aspect of the story worth getting, worth getting Guy's books, Jonathan's books, Ted Barris's books. You've got, you, you know, just get them all. You'll like them all. So thanks for everybody for watching. I'll see you all again tomorrow. This is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying thanks. Thanks again.